When we think about bullying, we do know that 60% of kids are not involved as perpetrators or victims or bully victims, right? But they're bystanders. They stand around or we hope that they're upstanders at some point. So they're either standing around hoping that the, the perpetrator group or individual doesn't turn on them, or they could be um, contributing to it, uh, if you will, kind of adding fuel to the fire. Um, and so there has been an increased focus on, we need to understand why it is that kids don't intervene. How can we promote intervention? So much so that you'll see um, social media movements of bystander empowerment and bystander revolution. Well, the reality is, is the social science only in the last five years has really started to emerge. And what we know from doing social network studies where we go and we ask kids who are your friends and then we ask if they're willing to intervene and help others is that it's largely, especially in early adolescence, driven by the extent to which I think my friends would want me to intervene. Do we intervene as a group? So it's what we call homophily, birds of a feather flock together. So if I hang out with my peers and that's just what we do, uh, we intervene, um, then I will be more likely to intervene as an individual. So it's important to understand that it's not an individual characteristics. It's not as simple as putting bracelets on and making posters and giving pencils and shirts. That there's really a decision tree. Kids make a decision of whether or not to help others uh, based on what their friends might expect them to do. And so that's what that study has shown. So what we tried to do was to do a meta-analysis. And if you don't know what a meta-analysis is, a meta-analysis is simply a summary of a body of literature that, uh, that tells us what works under what conditions. So we did a meta-analysis, and I'm just going to show you, this was published in the School Psych Review, certainly you can find that online. Um, and we evaluated 12 programs, and we looked at the extent to which kids that were in a bystander intervention program actually changed their behavior and intervened to help others versus kids that were in a schools where there was no bystander intervention, what we call the control schools. I want to call one of the tables that you'd see in the um, paper highlights what we find. And what you see here, um, and I'll walk you through this, is a high school effect size of 0.44. So that means that's pretty big, right? So the K through eight effect size is 0.13. The 0.13 um, showed increases in bystander intervention, but it's a real low effect, but it's still, it's still a significant effect. For the kids in the high schools, um, their effect size was three times as big. So there was major, major increase in bystander intervention. So we have to look and say, why? Well, if you look at the one table in the publication, you see that in the high school, the effect size was 0.46 for one of the studies called Build Respect. And for many of the psychologists that are watching this, you would hopefully recognize that second author, Prochesca, and it's Prochesca Norcross. And it's based on this really good um, theory around behavior change. That many of us out there have great intentions and we pre-pre-contemplate behavior change, whether that's going to the gym or whether that's changing our eating habits, right? We pre-contemplate. Well, what we know from the basic developmental literature is that kids also think about, think about intervening, right? I thought about helping that kid, but then something blocks them. So this is really based on this idea of theory of, of theory of behavior change that it's just not as simple as tell kids to intervene when in reality many of the adults around them are not intervening right and so they might contemplate it but then when they they say well i don't know if the adults are really going to follow through and it puts me at risk this particular program recognized that the kids think about intervening and they just need the kind of skills to enact that so it's very very positive um, when we look at the basic developmental literature, because we don't have much time, bystander intervention is not as simply as just telling kids to intervene. That we know that younger kids intervene more than the middle school students, and we understand that we can train the high school kids to, to engage in these behaviors, and they seem uh, responsive to that. We also know that girls are more likely to intervene than boys. We also know that if there's a norm in the school to intervene, if the adults are intervening, the kids will be more likely to intervene. If the norm is of violence, they will not intervene, right? So what I always say to people, if you want to um, implement a bystander intervention program, you probably should get your violence problem in check before you do that. Um, because it's kind of sends kids a, a message that I'm not safe here, but you want me to then create even more unsafe spaces. Uh, so we need to make sure that your level of bullying and victimization is low enough that kids can have that safe space to intervene and help. You know, there's a real question of whether or not, you know, we need to have long drawn out programs, right? In the area of bystander intervention, we got the huge effect size and huge increase in bystander intervention with a two month program. So we need to think through that. We certainly do know that kids need, one, to value intervention, but also they need the skills and we need to model this behavior for them as adults.